Well, good morning and welcome to the city. My name is Pastor Tony, and I'm the lead pastor of this incredible church that we get to call the city. I'm so blessed to be able to pastor such an incredible group of individuals, and, and I'm just blessed to be here. You know, being here is a good thing. Amen? And uh, I want to welcome all of those who are watching online, my friend Mike and Jacob, and we've got people literally all over this nation and the world who are tuning in, who are actually a part of this family. They're contributing to the mission and vision of this family, and they're doing a great work even though they're not here. So can we give them a hand as well? And speaking of that, this morning, I kind of want to talk to you guys a little bit about vision. You know, a couple of times a year, I find that it's necessary to talk about vision because the Bible talks a lot about vision. And, and we, we have something coming up that we do. We call it Heart for the House or Legacy that's coming up in December. And I'll talk more about that later on in the month. But I want to talk to you a little bit about vision because, listen, we, we're not just here because. Look at your neighbor say, you're not just here because. Say, you're here because God has a plan and a purpose for you. But listen, the plan and purpose is not enacted, it is not activated, it is not um, um, real until we engage in the mission and in the vision that God has for our lives. And just to give you guys a quick little snapshot, because I'm going to kind of go over this in the next couple of months, I don't want to, you know, give all my goods in the first part. You know, it's kind of like dating. You don't want to give it all to them up front. You know what I'm saying? You want to let them know everything up front because they could be crazy. Can I get an amen? Right? You don't want to give them your address right away. Don't tell them where you live. You know, give them just the first three numbers of your phone number and not the last four numbers to see if they really want you. They'll try to figure it out. But like, girl, man, I've called 9,949 people trying to find you. You know he might be the one, right? And, and, and listen, when we're looking at vision, sometimes we don't realize how good we're doing because we don't have a scoreboard to look at. And and a lot of times what the enemy will do in our lives is he will have us regretting and beating ourselves up about all the misses we've had, and we never see all the wins that we're having. So I just want to give you guys a quick little snapshot of what you guys are doing here at the city. So just this year in 2023, in the first nine months, of 2023, we have seen 1,076 salvations in this church. Over a 1,000 salvations. We have seen this year 144 baptisms this year. We have had 289 first-time kids in our kids' church in the back. So listen, y'all, I know that it may not feel like when you're serving, you're making a difference. I know when you're in the parking lot, it may not feel like a lot. When you're out here telling people hello, when you're in the back taking care of babies and wiping snotty nose and stinky butts, when you're back there with those kids who are running wild and you're begging them to stop running by giving them candy, I'm telling you, you are making a difference in this community. Amen? And listen, I'm telling you, that is something to celebrate. Over a thousand souls going to heaven because we, come on, that's, you ought to stand up because the Bible says that when one comes back to Christ, that all of heaven rejoices because of one. So listen. I'm going to train y'all. We're going to get good at that kind of stuff. We're going to start celebrating the right kind of things. Because, the, listen, if all of heaven, all of it, gets up when one person comes back, when I said yes to Jesus, everybody got up in heaven, well, we know we about to get up. Because I'm trying to be in heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, if you don't want to stand, you might not want to go to heaven. Come on, Jesus, because the Bible says everybody's standing up there. Right? You ain't going to be able to be sitting there all mad like. They gonna be, God going to be like, go on and move him to the other place. Let us know if he want to stay. 
I bet you'd be standing if it'd be hot. You'd be like, oh. All right, I'm going to leave you all alone. Praise God. All right. Not, listen, once you get to heaven, you can't go to hell. So just let me just go ahead and say that out there. Somebody, somebody got nervous in the back. They got nervous. We, we, we going to heaven. Everybody say, I want to go to heaven. All right, me too. But I want to talk about a little bit today is that God has a mission and a vision for the church, but he also has a mission and a vision for your life. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to talk about the mission and vision of the church, but today I want to talk a little bit about the vision of your life. Because when we're talking about vision, it is one of the most important components to the life of not just a believer, but anybody. Because the Bible actually tells us in Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Do you know that the Bible only references people perishing twice? It says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And then it says, without a vision, my people perish. So, so vision is, is, is important because without it, we will find ourselves as as, as people who are perishing, we feel like we're not making it. In fact, when we look at the book of Acts, it looks like this a little bit. It says, and in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And, and we would think like that means all, well, I'm going to pour out my spirit and, and, and crazy things are going to happen. Revival is going to break out and all this stuff's going to start happening in the land. But actually, that's not what it says. It says that when God begins to pour out his spirit, that three things begin to happen. The first one is it says, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all people and your sons and your daughters will begin to prophesy. You know what that means? They're going to begin to see. And then it says, your young men will see what? And your old men will begin to dream dreams. So what happens when God's spirit is being poured out, vision is coming alive. Vision is being cast forth. Dreams are being resurrected or they're being birthed out of people. And we're seeing that happen right here before our very eyes. God has an incredible vision and dream for this church. And we have not seen even the smallest component of what God wants to do through us here. But it's going to take all of us to do it. So I'm not going to be able to do it by myself. And the truth is, you can't do it by yourself either. We're going to need each other to do what God has called us to do. Amen? But I like that, that scripture in Proverbs. I like the message. The message, by the way, is not a different interpretation. It's just a paraphrase of what it is, God's word. So it's not like, it's not like the New Living Translation, the King James. Like, it's just a, a, a paraphrase of it. That's why I like it. It breaks it down in a simpler way. And that same scripture in the message says this. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. If you don't see, and I don't tell you, and you don't understand that two weeks ago, we fed over 523 families right out of this building. What will happen is you'll begin to stumble all over yourself wondering what you're doing as you're wandering all throughout the earth. And the Bible says, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Listen, I want to live a blessed life. Which means in order to live a blessed life, I must attend to what God is doing and what's important to him. All right, so look at your neighbor say, it's not about you. Say it's all about him. It's all about him. So what should we be doing then, pastor, if that is true? Because we're talking about vision. And what we should be doing even in our spiritual lives, like what should I be doing spiritually even? But what I'm finding in, 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 in pastoring people, I'm not going to point out names or call numbers, but what I'm finding is a lot of people are really trying. They're really trying. But, they're, but what's happening is they're aiming at something, and some of us are hitting it. But the problem is it's not God's vision for your life. You know, in 2004, 
in the, during the Olympics, the Olympics were in Athens. It was kind of like very historic because it's like this is where the Olympics started in Athens, Greece. You know, it was like really big, really awesome. And um, we actually had a guy, our, our team, you know, the USA, we had this guy, and his name was Matthew Emmons. And he was a rifle, like he shot rifles, you know, like competed in rifle shooting. And he had competed and won the 50-meter rifle shooting. This dude was an OG. Like, this dude was on gold. You know what I'm saying? He was gold, gold, gold. In fact, everybody who was competing against him already knew he was going to win the gold. They were competing just to get on the podium for second or third. And he, was, he had gotten to his, his final race. And what had happened was he was going and he had built up such a great lead. And what I learned about these guys, which I felt was really intriguing, as these riflemen who have become experts, they actually have, have conquered the ability to truly control their bodies. That when they aim, they have the ability to literally slow their heartbeat down. So much so that they can time nearly two seconds of a pause in their heart. Stops. One, two. And during that pause, they, that's where they're, because the, you know, any, any of y'all ever shot a gun? Okay, I just need to know. We got a video over here. <laughs> but, but if you, if, listen, your breathing can just cause you to do like this. If you, they call it, if you pull the trigger rather than squeeze the trigger, it'll cause you to do this. There are all these things that impact whether or not you're going to hit the target in the bullseye. And, and listen, Matthew was, he was the greatest. Slowed his heart, ping, ping. He's, he's got this giant lead. Nobody's catching him. He gets to the last target. Everybody is cheering. <sighs> You know, can you imagine? It's like you're in Athens, like you're on the hill. Like, let's go. Gold. He gets to the last target. He slows his heart down, takes the breath. Tink. Bullseye. Yes, let's go. Give me the gold, y'all. But as soon as he hit the target, his face looked like this. That's him. I've seen that face on a lot of you a lot of times. I have also made that face a lot of times. And that face is the uh-oh face. Am I right? And what he, what, he, what he did was he hit the bullseye on somebody else's target. All he had to do to win gold was hit the target Anywhere. He just had to hit his target. Gold. But because he hit someone else's target, he got zero points and took eighth place. No medal. See, a lot of us in the room are aiming at targets that are someone else's or not the ones that God has ordained for our lives. And the problem is, we're struggling because we're not getting any points. We're not getting any points. The great D.L. Moody. Come on, some of y'all in here remember Moody Radio. Come on, somebody, somebody, somebody. He was quoted as saying this. Our greatest fear should not be failure, but succeeding at something that does not really matter. Our greatest fear should not be failure, it should be at succeeding at something that does not really matter. And, and what I've learned over the years is that everyone will end up somewhere, but few people end up somewhere on purpose. Everybody will end up somewhere. But hey, how'd you get here? I don't know. But I'm here. But few people end up getting somewhere actually on purpose. So I wanted to kind of dig this out because when God is calling us as a body and he's calling you as an individual, our goal should be to hit that target. The target that is in front of us. The target that God has assigned to us. 
So today is about getting everyone here today on target. Say, I want to get on target. So, so one of the ways that we do that is we have this thing here that we call City Steps. We have completely redone City Steps. If you have not taken City Steps, you need to get into City Steps. It's the on-ramp for our church. It's so that you can get to know us, we can get to know you, and the purpose inside of you can get activated so that you can start hitting the target that God has in front of you. Okay? So, so we would encourage you, get in. You say, well, Pastor, I already took it. Well, listen, it's gooder than it was last time. Okay? I'm telling you, it's so much better. And listen, it's, we, we're going to have it right after the second service on today, step number two. We just silently relaunched it last week. And I'm telling you, it's powerful. It's powerful. So how do we then find out the vision for our lives? Well, the first, I like to say we've got to do four things. First, we've got to give our lives to Jesus. Right? So, so let me say this. I'm going to give you all four, then I'm going to go through them. How about that? That'd be okay? So you got to give your life to Jesus. you got to be made new by Jesus. you got to become like Jesus. And then you got to do what Jesus did. So let's start with the first one. we got to give our lives to Jesus. Giving our life to Jesus is actually not only attending church. Giving your life to Jesus isn't just about singing the songs that the worship team are singing on Sunday morning and doing an incredible job. And really giving your life to Jesus isn't even just believing. See, he has called us to actually follow him. Giving your life to Jesus is following Jesus. Okay, it's following Jesus. And in order to follow Jesus, we have to surrender our lives to him. So, so I want to talk about that. Because Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, he says, and then he called the crowd. See, Jesus always had a crowd around him. See, there was always a massive group of individuals around Jesus because Jesus was just such an intriguing guy. People wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to see what he was going to do. They were, they were inspired by him. But the thing about Jesus is Jesus was never for leaving you like you are. If you had an encounter with Jesus, you were going to be different when you left. Amen? So he calls to the crowd. These are the people who just showed up, right? They just showed up. They're like, hey, you know, what's going on? Well, we heard about Jesus. He said, he said I, I, I called to the crowd and to his disciples. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and do what? Follow me. And then he says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet to forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? In other words, he's saying, listen, you can't get to the end and try to buy your way. There's no exchange. Right? Right? He's saying there's no, you can't be like, well, you know, I got, a, I got, you know, 800 grand in the bank, Jesus, man. I know you're working on paving those streets of gold, you know. I was wondering if I could get a brick for 800 grand, right? No, there's no exchange. He said if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with holy angels. But I felt like it got tight in here right there. But that's okay. Because we've got to be able to be honest enough. And I have to be willing to love you enough. And we have to be willing to love each other enough. To be able to be truthful enough. So that we can be who God has called us to be. Amen. So when we talk about giving our lives to him, Jesus is calling us to a deeper level. Y'all, that was pretty deep. He wasn't like, hey, guys, just follow me around and, you know, I'm going to feed you guys two fish, five loaves. We're going to see a lot of miracles. It's going to be cool. 
He called him. He said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. He said, matter of fact, if you get ashamed of me and embarrassed, talking about, you know, Jesus, and you like, oh, I don't know about that, brother. Or, you know what I'm saying? He said, okay, that's cool. I'll be ashamed too. Like, he was calling us deep. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, 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 okay. It's, it's, it's okay. It's not bad. But how do we get to a deeper level? And these are the two things that get us there. Number one, we got to surrender our life to his will and his ways. So we surrender. What, what is the exchange? My will for your will. What did Jesus say to the Father? Not my will, but your will be done. Right? So it's an exchange of wills. That is what we call salvation, guys. So one of the things that God has, the vision for God, is that you be saved. Right? That you would not perish. That you would have everlasting life. And, and listen, that does not mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to mess up. Look back at him and say, I did already today. Right? I did this morning. Praise the Lord. Right? Like, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry already. But what it does mean is it, it means I'm going to give Jesus control of my life. His, his word and his way are now going to be my guide, okay? And my opinion is no longer going to matter because I'm not following my feelings. I'm following Jesus. Okay, so, so feelings aren't going to be my GPS. It's not, listen, we never heard Jesus say, well, you know, I feel like. He never said that. Right? He said, I've come to do the will of my Father, and the will of my Father I'm coming to do. Right? So we, we, we don't follow our feelings. We follow Jesus. Everybody say, follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. And then the second thing we've got to do is we've got to spend time with him every day. We've got to spend time with him. We've got to read. We say here, 15 minutes. Everybody in the room can do 15 minutes. Five minutes of reading your Bible, five minutes of prayer, five minutes listening to a worship song on your way to work because you got six minutes to get there. Come on, somebody. Right? You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. So you got to spend time with them. You got to spend time with them. So we're moving from a crowd level relationship with Jesus to a personal level relationship. And the way that you know this is your first step and for some of you in here today, it is your first step, is that right now you have an emptiness and a void in you. There is a hole and there's a wandering that you're doing and you're searching and you're hoping to find this thing that can fill you to make you complete. Because the reality is, is right now you don't feel complete, you feel incomplete. You got into the relationship but they didn't because they weren't created to fill that hole. And if you put them in the hole or in the space that they were never meant to be in, the relationship's going to be real hard in the yard, folks. The reason that we can have the marriage we have is everyone is in their rightful place. God's where he's supposed to be. Pastor Faith is where she's supposed to be. The kids are where they're supposed, like everything is in alignment. And when things are where they're supposed to be, they work well. I mean, think about it, Kurt. When, when you have an engine, if something is out of place, the motor's not going to run the way it's supposed to run. Am I right, y'all? But somehow, some way, we put things out of order and we're expecting this smooth running machine. We got to get back into place. Amen. Amen. So we give our lives to Jesus, and then number two, we got to be made new by him. I want everybody in the room to hear me really, really good. All of your sins, past, present, and future, so that's everything you have done, are doing, and will do, have been paid for. When you give your life and you surrender your life to Jesus, he pays the past the present, and the future, okay? It's better than the black card, y'all. Like, you know that, y'all, anyone ever heard of that? That's, it's like, there's no balance. 
You just like, it's just, you just go. You be like, hey, man, I want a $20 million lot. Yeah, pow. Throw your black card down. Like, Jesus has got the red blood card. You know what I'm saying? There, listen, it's like, oh, you did that last night? Pow. Oh, you was going to go do? Pow. You want to go? Pow. 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 And every time the devil comes to accuse you, you just throw your red card out like, pow. Right? So we got a red card. We got a red card. But, but look, at what, look at what it says here. Because when, when I'm looking about being made new, being made new doesn't happen automatically. So you give your life to Jesus, but it doesn't completely change us yet. See, you, you still have wounds. You still have pains. You still got attitudes. We still got bad habits and addictions. Come on, right? And they don't just automatically go away like, Lord, I give you my life. Gone. Now, they can. Like, I, when I got saved, there were some things that just, they were gone. And then there were some things, well, I had to work. I had to work. I had to work. But, but how do I know? Well, the Bible says in Philippians that we got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So we work out our salvation, the Apostle Paul said. So, so <laughs> we're working through the past, I call it peace, pain, right? Past in people. We're working through that, right? We're working through that. And we're working toward a better version of ourselves. That's what it should look like. But how do I know if I've got that thing? Well, this is how you know. If the thing in your life wasn't in your life and your life would be better because it's not, then you know you got a thing. And everybody in the room has something in their life, a habit, an attitude, an addiction, a what it, we can go all the way. Every, if it wasn't in your life, your life would be better. Let me see. 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 Okay, good. So we all have something that God has called us to work out. We got to work it out. And, and when you give your life to Jesus, the Bible says whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But we've got to learn how to live in that freedom. Okay? We got to, listen, we're free, but we got to learn how to live free. All right? We got to learn how to live that. That's step four of City Steps, by the way. But, but it kind of reminds me of this movie that when I was growing up, it was in the 90s. I got any folks who were alive in the 90s in here? Praise the Lord. And it was a Mel Gibson movie called Braveheart. Come on. Okay. Those are my OGs. They're like, yeah, man, I remember Braveheart. You know, come on. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, John? It was like when you watch Braveheart, you know, you get up off the couch walking a little taller like. Huh? I wish somebody would break in my house right now. I'll paint my face blue and take somebody out right now. I'll go in my kitchen and grab a butter knife and, and fillet somebody up, you know. But, but there's this part in Braveheart, you know, where they're getting ready. He's got this little Scottish army. They're getting ready to go against this giant army from England, you know. And, 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 and Mel Gibson is like, so what are we going to do? And the, and the guys are like, run, brother. Like, they're like, run. We're going to run. That's what we're going to do. We are going to run. Because, because, listen, a lot of us just are trying to survive. But then he says this famous line. He said, run and you will live, at least for a little while. He said, and in dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for just one chance, just one chance to come back and tell your enemies that they may take your lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Amen? They'll never take, and then he's like, freedom! You know, goes down the line, chick, 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 hits everybody's sword, right? And they're like, ah! And for some of us today, we've got to get to the place where we're sick and tired of being dominated by an enemy, where we say, you might try to take me out, but you're not going to take my freedom. 
Because Jesus died. I'm, I'm blood bought, born from a man who died on a cross, who, who was willing to give everything so that I could live. I'm not going to live bound anymore. We've got to make that decision. Enough is enough. There was an old rap song back in the 90s. And, and listen, he said, I ain't a killer, but don't push me. You know what I'm saying? And at some point, you got to have gotten pushed around enough by the things that are depressing you, causing anxiety in you, fear in you, all these things that have been dominating you that you said, you know what? I've had enough. Because the thing is, he came to set you free. The Bible said Jesus died on the cross. It says it was for freedom he died. For freedom. For freedom. But how do we get free? Well, the first way we get free is we've got to confess our sins to Jesus. 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We got to ask God to forgive us. Most of us in the room don't have that problem because we know when we talk to God, our sin is still a secret. But the Bible says that we have to confess two times. We confess to Jesus, but then we have to confess to somebody else. See, we got to let somebody else know what we're battling with. In fact, James chapter 5 says this, therefore confess your sins to who? Each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. For the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So you go to God for forgiveness, but you go to God's people for healing. That's why we've got to get into a group with godly friends. I'm going to tell you this, and I'm telling you, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but I know that I'm supposed to say it. If your friends let you act like the old you, cuss like the old you, have the same old you attitude, if, if you talk about this all the past all the time, if, if you live back there and those are your friends, I'm telling you right now, they really don't love you. They don't. Because if you're my friend, you might mess around and drop a cuss word. But I'm going to tell you like, hey, man, you don't got to say that. You, you, listen, you're so intelligent, you could use another word for that word. Well, are you going to go to hell for cussing? Look at me. No. But the Bible says this, that we ought to not let any corrupt co communication come out of our mouth. You know, we used to say to our kids when they were little and they would be crying, hey, because they wanted something. We'd be like, be quiet. Use your words. They can't let you be the old you when God's calling you to be a new version of you. You need to get around people who aren't going to judge you because that's the other side of it. You're not the judge because you're not God. So don't be over there getting on them like, uh-huh, girl, you know what? That's off too. You can be way right or way left. Both are wrong. But love you enough to say, listen, don't you know you are beautifully and wonderfully made? You don't got to talk like, you don't got to act like. You, you know what? God has a greater. And I, listen, I, I messed up too, girl. What if we help each other? Pray for each other. Believe for each other. What if, what if Grant and I, it's like, hey, man, I'm going to help you and you help me. You, you know, you shoot me a text, man. Hey, how you doing today, man? You, are you good? I, I, I like to, I've been asking this question to people because it would be messing them up. Hey, how's your soul right now? Right, that's a hard, that, listen, you know that's a hard, you're like, oh, oh, it's fine. But it's like, hey, man, you know, you good. No, man, I'm, I'm actually struggling. 
And, and I'm telling you, it was the craziest thing. I literally turned on the TV, and there was this half-naked woman on the Dove commercial. And I just immediately, my mind started to just go crazy, and I started lusting after her. I need you to pray for me, man, because I don't want to go out today and start my day where I'm just out here looking at women all kind of sexually and provocative. And you know what I'm saying? I, I want to be able to have some self-control. Will you pray for me real quick? Yeah, Father, in the name of Jesus, man, just touch his mind and his heart. I know that through confession, forgiveness is done, but I also know healing takes place. God, I know you have the power to give him what he needs to win today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, bro, we got this, man. We got it. That's what it looks like. It looks like that. Which leads me to the third thing. Because if we can give our life to Jesus, we can be made new like Jesus, which means we got to get honest. Then the third thing is we need to become like Jesus. How do we become like Jesus? Galatians 4.19 says this. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And again, and again, the Apostle Paul's like, man, I don't know how many times I'm going to tell y'all this, but I feel like I'm going through labor. He said, but I don't care. I'll keep going through it until Christ is fully developed in your life. I'm looking for that full development. Because the truth of the matter, when we talk about becoming like Jesus, there are some of us in the room who really do love God. There are some of us in the room who have surrendered our lives to him. We're serving him. But that does not mean we don't get to continue to become more like him. Everyone in the room qualifies for this step, to become more like Jesus. In fact, we can't stop. There are some of us who've been in the church a long time, and we've developed such a routine in our relationship with God that the truth of the matter is we've stopped. We've stopped pursuing him. We've stopped believing in him, chasing him, dreaming and having visions with him, believing for the miracles, the signs and wonders in our families because we know what to pray, how to pray. We know what to do and what not to do at church. We've conquered everything at work. We know the attitude and the behavior, but we've stopped in our pursuit. I want to challenge you guys to keep going. Don't stop. God has more. God has more. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you guys to write this down. What part of your life does not look like Jesus? What part of your life doesn't look like him? And then I'm going to ask you, are you working on it? Are you working on it? See, God has called us to develop spiritual disciplines so that we can discover spiritual gifts. It's in my calling that focuses my disciplines and my discipleship with him. You guys need to take city steps. Fill the room up today. Fill it up. I'm going to do it again. Do you know how many times I've done it again with God? A lot. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. Get on the dream team. Start serving. It's in doing those things that your disciplines and your discipleship grows. Do you know why people are like, man, how do you understand the Bible like that? How do you go through, how do you, and they're asking me this, it's because of my calling. I have to study. I have to, I got to do all these things. And all it does is it's leading me to a greater relationship with Him. And what I do every week is I preach out of the overflow of what God is saying to me. And guess what I found? It isn't just me he's talking to. It's all of us. It's all of us. Which leads me to the last thing. When we give our life to Jesus, we allow him to make us new. We work on becoming like him. 
the last thing we got to do is we just got to do what he did. Jesus reached lost people. That was his primary focus. So what's the vision? The lost. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. That's why I'm here. That's the vision. That's the target. It's the person sitting next to you that if you knew their story, you probably wouldn't have sat next to them. Or maybe if you knew their story, you would begin to believe that God could set you free too. See, there's a room full of testimonies because God has a mission for a room full of people who are called according to his name. For a room full of people who would seek his face. For a room full of people that he wants to give the land to. But he'll only give it if our mission is not our will but his. Not our target, our neighbor's target, but his. And if we'll do that, we'll see the fruit like we've never seen, not just here. Listen, God is never gonna build the church without building you. That's not how he does it. He builds you so that you can build the church. Stand to your feet. Jesus challenged those who were serious about following him. And I want you to look at this, because in Matthew chapter 4, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were what? Everybody say it. They were fishermen. And he said to them, come and... So what does it really look like to follow Jesus? And he said, come follow me, and I will send you out to do what? Fish. For what? People. Followers fish. Which means we got to ask ourselves, how many lost people am I bringing into the house? How many conversations am I having where people can feel my love, not my judgment, so that they want to have an encounter with the King. If we call ourselves believers and we say that we're a Christian, followers fish, and that means we ought to be fishing. Amen? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? I know that right now we're talking about giving our lives to Jesus. We're talking about being made man, brand new and we're talking about becoming like him and doing what he did, but it all starts with one. And maybe you're in the room and you just don't know Jesus. You've never given your life to him. And you can't get to step four without first doing the first one. And you're here today and you're saying to yourself, you know, I wanna give my life to him I want to surrender my way for his way, my will for his will. And I really want to try to fill that void that is inside of my heart. If that's you, I just want you to just lift up your hand in the room and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. I see hands over here and here and here, over here. Thank you for being so brave over there and over there. Amen. Or how about you're in the room, and today was a day that you realized, I'm hitting the wrong target. God has a target, and the truth is, I've been aiming at what I want to aim at, and I realized that God has a better target for my life. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up in the air as well. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, you saw every hand that was lifted as a sign to surrender to you. God, I pray that right now you would wash 
them and make them clean. Your word says that if we would confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, God, we could be saved. So Father, right now, God, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of our sins. And because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to have eternal life through you. But God, it's not just eternal life you wanna give us, it's a fellowship, a relationship with you and the Father. So God, I pray that right now for all of us in the rooms, God, you would begin to search our hearts. God, so that we could be more like you. We could act more like you. We could become brand new through you. Because God, our real desire is to do what you did. So Father, I pray God that you would give us an excitement and a zeal, a passion and a pursuit to seek after you in your face so that we can be a church that's not just talked about because we're cool, but a church that's talked about because we're on the move. Grow us, God. Groom us and use us to do mighty and incredible things for you and for the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, let's put our hands together. Thank you so much for watching the City YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss a single video and feel free to even share this with a friend. You can also support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button below to help us to continue to reach people all around the world for Jesus Christ. We also want you to check the description to learn how you can get connected to our church via a digital connection card, C groups, and many other more exciting events that we have. I wanna thank you guys again for watching. We're so grateful for you, your support, and we can't wait to see you soon.